All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming to our session here where we're going to have lightning talks on water and agricultural topics. Uh, I'm Tyler Erickson. I just stepped into this role about five minutes ago uh, because our, our, our MC that was scheduled for this is stuck in traffic. Uh, but we're going to uh, get started. We have a series of, I believe, 10 talks over the next hour uh, that we're going to go through. So I am, without further ado, going to introduce the first speaker. Uh, Abe Terapani from Atlas AI. Hi, everyone. I'm Abe Terapani, the CEO of Atlas AI. A lot of the talks today are going to share amazing advances in how satellite imagery and machine learning are being used to map physical elements of the planet, from flood levels to crop productivity to land use. My talk's going to highlight how these same technologies are also being used to enhance our understanding of local poverty levels around the world and how local poverty measurement can help to improve the targeting of programs, especially those aimed at the most vulnerable and underserved communities on the planet. The core innovation behind Atlas AI was the integration of various satellite image sources, ground survey data, and deep learning models to predict local livelihood outcomes of households. On the right-hand side of the screen, I've illustrated this with Atlas AI's estimates of per capita spending capacity of local citizens across Kenya. This data is available at a one kilometer spatial resolution as recently as 2021, and we update it every year with 20 plus years of history. Often the best alternative data is years out of date and aggregated up to a state level. It makes it very difficult to target programs, especially those aimed at rural communities that fall well within the bounds of the data that's available. Dating back to our origins at Stanford and still today at the company, all of our methods are published and peer reviewed in journals. We believe even for for-profit companies operating in this space, it's critical to enable transparency of the underlying methods that we're working with and the validity of results, especially uh, because of the, life, the critical nature of these applications. Alice AI's technology is, is built from three core components. The first, which I've highlighted already, is high-resolution socioeconomic data, data that helps to understand the local development conditions of communities around the world. The second are a set of predictive algorithms that harness that socioeconomic data to aid in our understanding of where investment can either promote growth or alleviate vulnerability. And finally, an application layer that helps non-technical users harness that data and monitor the effect of organizations over time in, in reaching these communities. All of this technology is built on Earth Engine and Google Cloud, and we're really proud to be a, an inaugural partner of the Google Cloud Ready Sustainability Program. Let me close with two case studies. Acquia is a nonprofit organization focused on improving global health outcomes uh, with, with a focus on improved access to safe water and sanitation. Aquaya used Atlas AI's technology in Ghana to highlight where are the rural communities that could potentially best benefit from expanded access to water and sanitation, including where district governments might improve that access via subsidy programs. Miagro works with smallholder farmers to improve access to markets, and they're working with Atlas AI's technology across eight countries in Africa with a focus on improving market access and reaching those communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to do short introductions from here for the next speaker as they come up. Uh, Rebecca Oman is a geospatial analyst supporting the United States Department of Agricultural Foreign Agricultural Service. This role, she analyzes remote sensing observations to inform global estimates of crop production impacted by climate conditions and conflict. All right, can you all hear okay with the mask? Perfect. Uh, well, like I just was introduced, my name is Rebecca Oman, and I work with the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service using Earth observations to research global agriculture. Our goal is to estimate crop production accurately around the globe uh, to maintain stable food systems and economic relationships. Climate trends, conflict, and extreme weather events can all cause changes to crop conditions and food production that are unexpected and difficult to quantify. 
Using the tools and data sets available in Earth Engine, we can start with the spectral values of a single pixel and create a product that indicates the conditions of a crop across an entire country. Even better, with the availability of this near real-time data that we have, we can monitor crops as they progress through different stages of development, even within a season. One of our ongoing projects that you all might be familiar with after the machine learning training sessions um, is performing on-demand crop classifications. We start by mosaicing multispectral bands that demonstrate the values and signatures of a single crop type. Combining this with data from the field or from expert optical sampling, we train these machine learning algorithms to recognize one particular crop type among fields that may look quite similar to the human eye. The result is a model that indicates where we can predict this particular crop type being grown, which can be used to drill for data regarding the conditions of that crop in particular. And in this context, data drilling refers to taking all these large data sets that we have and filtering them to reveal conditions of one particular crop. We can also take the data sets in Earth Engine and bring them to agriculture experts who might not have this technical background. So we have this user-friendly application where we can take uh, data sets from a variety of dates, samples, and uh, yeah, sample data and backgrounds and display them side by side, be able to do analysis. Experts can mask out cropland in general or more specifically a single crop type. Here we have an example of our app being used to assess cropland flooding in Pakistan this past August. On the left, we have a water index paired with a display of crops reaching phenological maturity in this season on the right. Um, at, at a glance, we can see how these crops reaching maturity have quite a bit of overlap with that blue water extent. Uh, these data have so much potential to reveal conditions on the ground that we might not have access to otherwise. And it's great to be part of this, bringing people and data together in this context. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. I will invite the next speaker up. I am realizing since there's such lightning talks, I am going to actually let the uh, speakers introduce themselves to give them as much time as possible. Uh, so with that, I will thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarwar Bek el -Tazarov. I'm from Institute Research Institute IAMO in Germany. And it's not a secret that climate is changing. And uh, due to this climate change, the frequency magnitude and severeness of extreme weather events are also increasing. And these extreme weather events are creating negative impact on, in many sectors, particularly in agricultural production. While the, the 30 to 50 percent of um, population in developing countries uh, depends on the agricultural production. So therefore, coping with uh, agricultural production caused by climate is very essential. And as a potential solution and a promising solution to deal with the uh, weather risk, the so-called in insurance product, so-called index-based, uh, weather-based index insurance has been suggested. And this weather-based insurance uh, be designed based on the w existing uh, historical weather information. And however, the, uh, this, this insurance product is very promising and uh, uh, very easy, the dissemination is going very slow and not well. Due to the limited weather stations and the historical weather data in developing countries. And as a potential solution to deal, in, uh, to deal with the data limitations in such regions, the using satellite-based information has been suggested. And uh, satellite-based remote sensing, we, in our institute, we did a uh, systematic review of available, globally available satellite information and check their accuracy and ability to detect the extreme weather events and to design uh, index insurance products. And we, for analysis, we used multiple um, satellite-based information like uh, precipitation, temperature, vegetation indexes, uh, evapotranspiration, and soil moisture. And we in general, we can say that uh, satellite-based, uh, globally available satellite-based information uh, in Google Earth engine 
can, um, can, uh, can serve as a good source of information for index insurance development uh, in many uh, data limited regions. However, careful selection of index method and the time period is uh, very important. And based on our research, we publish it until now. We publish it one paper, and two papers are ongoing. Uh, and we did uh, multiple uh, web applications to support people uh, in uh, in the limit data limited regions to uh, to get information from the satellite sources. Thank you very much. All right, our next speaker I'd like to invite up, Danny Foley from the USGS. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. How can a map help feed the planet? Or better phrased, how can a map provide the information so we can make more informed decisions on if we will have enough water to feed the planet? Those are questions that I ask in my research. I'll be talking today about crop water productivity. That is a ratio of the amount of water input to produce a certain amount of crop as output. As we all know, I've seen countless news stories over the last couple of years that the demand for water is increasing much greater than the supply, especially here in Cal California and in the Southwest. With uh, Lake Powell and Lake Mead at record lows, the Colorado River uh, water allocations being cut, so if we can better understand how 80 to 90% of human water use that goes to agriculture is being used, then therefore we can have a better understanding to help mitigate food and water security. Therefore, the main goal of my research was to measure, map, and model the crop water productivity of leading world crops and high water consuming crops using the Google Earth Engine cloud computing platform. First, a study area was established to measure nine crops in the Central Valley of California. Then using three main types of data, combining meteorological data, remote sensing data using Landsat 8 surface reflectance and thermal data with the aid of Google Earth Engine, acquiring the images and processing them, and then combining that with crop yield data from the California Department of Food and Agricultural Statistics, I was able to begin a crop water productivity analysis. This involved four main steps. First, mapping the crop types with the USDA cropland data layer. Then crop water use modeling, calculating actual evapotranspiration to measure water use. Then crop productivity modeling, which is a measure of yield. And finally, taking the water use and dividing that by the, or taking the yield and dividing that by the water use. First, I use Google Earth Engine to do a normalized different vegetation analysis to determine the growing season of each individual crop. Then through a series of remote sensing calculations in Earth Engine, determined the actual evapotranspiration, which is a measure of water use. Here shows a sequence where we start with a, these different maps, overlay them, then we can overlay with a crop type map, and we can produce the amount of water uh, that's used per crop. Major findings of this study have shown that in our study area, it took about 165 billion liters of water to produce about 35 million kilograms of water. That's about 1.5 gallons of water to produce one almond, or the equivalent to about 66,000 Olympic swimming pools in one 1,100 square kilometer area. So we can provide an incentive that if we can increase crop water productivity by just 10%, that can save about 15 billion liters of water. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker will be Fedor Bart from Del Taurus. Thank you. Hi, nice to meet you all. I'm uh, Fedor Bart. I'm an uh, architect on the Global Water Watch uh, team, and we're uh, scanning the whole world for uh, water. Yeah, we're scanning uh, for reservoirs. We actually started with this map, the Aqua Monitor, where we scanned the whole world for new land and new water. Actually, we discovered one small new island up there. Since then, I'm known as the discoverer of the uh, grape island. And, uh, yeah, but we now are taking this further, so we're trying to see all the new reservoirs popping up uh, that we see each day, and I hope it uh, works. Thanks for that tip. 
and uh, hey, you see them here on the uh, right. And uh, we're using Google Earth Engine together with our partners from WRI and WWF, uh, funded by uh, Google.Earth, to scan and find all these new reservoirs. Uh, we uh, recently published a paper on this uh, in the uh, Nature Scientific Reports, and we have a new website, globalwaterwatch.earth, and uh, we're presenting that also tomorrow in one of the booths uh, I uh, think so. Please come and visit me there if you want to know more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Julia Atai from Southern University and AMM College. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Atai, and I'm presenting on behalf of my team members. That's Abna Saryansa and Matsuda Anochi. So we are grateful to Geo good f Geo for Good for the opportunity for us to present our results on flood and drought mapping in the Volta Basin in West Africa. So the Volta Basin, because it's one of the largest basins in Africa and an important basin because it also cuts across six countries in, in West Africa. That's Burkina Faso, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, and Niger. However, the Volta Basin is faced with flood and drought and incident. So my team and I decided to look at how we'd be able to use the Google Earth engine to map the extent of the flood and drought extent within the basin. So with the flood extent, we used the Sentinel-1 SAR to map the flood extent from 2015 to 2022. And we found out that from 2020 to 2021, there was a severe flood incidence there. And according to the UN report, we also realized that it stated that about 1.2 billion people were affected in the West and Central Africa. So this shows that at least to map the extent of the flood within the basin will help inform decisions to ensure the sustainable management of the basin and also to reduce the impact of the flood incidents within the basin. And in terms of the drought incident, too, we saw that the high incidence of drought were recorded in 2019. Therefore, it shows that we need to come up with a sustainable measures to reduce the impact of climate incidents within the basin and also to help reduce the rates of food insecurity within the basin and also reduce the rates of people being displaced as a result of this climate incident which are faced within our African country, especially in the West Africa where I come from. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, our next speaker will be Giuliano Schrimbeck from Geocartan Matt Biomas Water. For the next, just here. Hi, um, I am Giuliano uh, and work at Geocartan in Matt Biomas, uh, land use, land cover, and Matt Biomas Water. Uh, I go talk about the Mabiomas Water Project. This project reconstructs the monthly uh, surface waters in Brazil uh, using Landsat images. The products is the surface waters, the transitions maps, uh, the trends of uh, increase or decrease, uh, the surface of water, and the classification of water bed bodies. Uh, we pl we planning to go beyond scientific impact in the pro in this project uh, to engage stakeholders and um, um, and uh, use a strategic communication. Uh, in first step of the project, uh, we made a, a stake uh, design team which is stakeholders uh, to planning the dashboard where participate more than twenty stakeholders institutions um, and this is important to uh, communication plan where uh, along one year the project has more than a thousand and fifth mainstream media conference and the platform uh, have more 203,000 uh, access uh, from different uh, from six 59 different countries around the world. Um, and uh, we stay uh, integrated with uh, ANA, the National Agency of Water. It's an um, uh, important partner of the projects. And uh, now we go to expand to South America. 
in three different groups in the Brazilian team and so uh, in Panama Panamazonic team and consult teams which uh, training uh, partners in all of countries uh, to use earth engine and map biomas water uh, mapping methodology this is our brazilian map biomas team thank you Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Enrique Tuya from Global Fishing Watch. Thank you. Just click the next for yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Enrique Tuya. I'm the director of technology and engineering at Global Fishing Watch. Global Fishing Watch uh, is an NGO. Uh, which ultimate goal is to um, have healthy, resilient, and productive oceans. Uh, there are other organizations that have similar aims, but the differentiator that we have is that we do this by creating new knowledge and creating tools to analyze that knowledge. So when we started creating our data set seven years ago, uh, we have a big challenge. We have historical data and how we got how can we get that data to decision makers to policy makers big data is hard and if you add the temporal aspect it's more hard so um, we started to, uh, an analyzing and we found that there were no technologies that allow that so besides creating our great data sets that i will not be focusing on this talk uh, we started creating technologies to explore that data and that's what I'm here to talk about. We created a rendering engine that we call Four Wings that we want to, that, that we know that can go beyond the marine uh, data sets. And we want to see if it can be used by other organizations. What we're trying to do is to low, lower the barrier for those NGOs that doesn't have access to a technical team or software development team or have, don't have access to data analysts that may be able to do this report. So the, the renderer that we have done enable doing fast and responsive spatial filtering. Here you can see how you can zoom, you can pan on the map. And here you can see the temporal aspect of it. Several tools you will see that you can pan, you can zoom, but you don't have this ability of seeing the entire historic archive and then drilling down to a specific month, a specific year, or maybe a specific hour, depending on the granularity of the data set. We also added the possibility of adding dynamic filtering. In our current version, we achieved this thanks to BigQuery and BI and Shine that allow us to filter on the fly. Even though you could have something that it's less expensive using static files. And you can see here how different colors are applying different filters. I think that this one is applying different flags. And at the same time, you see how on the time bar you see those graphs representing what you see on the screen. So um, we have achieved this with uh, four wings for the marine world. I, we want to see if this can be applied for other uh, areas. So please try it out. We have an open source version of it that you can go into our repository, download and play with your data set. It can also access all the data sets in Google Earth Engine. I'm also in the demo booth, so please visit and ask me any question if you have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker will be Anna Cardell from Brigham Young University. All right, hi, yeah, I'm Anna Cardell. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at Brigham Young University. Um, and 20 minutes away from um, BYU is this lovely lake here on the left. Um, and every summer since 2016, the beaches of this lake have been closed um, due to harmful algal blooms, or HABs. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding um, what causes um, HABs and what management and policy decisions should be made uh, to reduce their occurrence. But the problem is, is that we don't have an in-situ data set that's spatially and temporally comprehensive enough to um, answer the questions that we have about the health of the lake. Um, so if only we had a data set um, that reached back to, say, 1984 um, and had um, a measurement every 30 square meters of the lake <laughs> and those measurements came every 16 days. Um, that would be ideal. Um, but I guess we do have that data set because Landsat exists um, and Google Earth Engine exists. Um, 
So using Google Earth Engine, we can make um, images like the one here in the middle. So every pixel has a computed um, concentration of chlorophyll A, which is an index for um, algal biomass. Um, and we have thousands of such images. Um, that's the animation that's going on um, in the right here. So using that image collection, um, we were able to quantify trends um, in chlorophyll concentration over a, a 40 year period. Um, and um, here are a couple papers that we've, we've done on this. Um, and this back paper here, um, after we published it, I've gotten um, like over a dozen emails from like people and researchers in 12 different countries asking for our code. So as a roundabout way of cleaning up my inbox, <laughs> we decided to make um, tools um, in Google Earth Engine um, so that people um, can do the same sort of analysis. Um, and these projects involve three steps, which are um, first to like pair the in-situ data to um, remote sensing data, and then to create um, models of water quality parameters, and then to apply those to your images um, and do historical water quality assessment. So I'll be down, I'll have a demo station. I'd love to talk more about these tools. Um, um, yeah, we'd love to make um, this possible for any researcher, any water quality manager, um, for any water body in the world. Um, thank you. All right, thank you very much to all the speakers, nine speakers that were here. Uh, at this point, we can open it up to for questions. We do have a little bit of time before the end of our session, so I'd invite you to ask questions of any of the speakers that you had, and we will move mics around to catch their uh, question or catch their answers. So are there any anything that you want to know more about that you saw in the last 50 minutes? Yeah, I was wondering for the uh, Global Fishing Watch, do you use like uh, videos or something to store your data in? Or how do you get your data so fast to the client? So no, we don't uh, store images. What we do is we return a very compressed data in a custom format that it's just uh, multiple integers that contain all the information and we keep the payload really, really reduced, so it's very quick to download to the, the client. One in the back. Can we put the slide of the presenters on top? This is Hutch's great idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Uh, you will have to run the microphones for that then. <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, want to follow on with that question about four wings. Um, so is that like a UDF that you've defined in BigQuery to do those hexes, or, or is it running outside of BigQuery? So we have created a set of tables for different zoom levels and different granularity. So you will have one table for when you're running with uh, monthly aggregation, you have another table when you are using weekly, and then another table for hourly. And depending on the zoom level, both in time and space, you go to one of those tables that are pressure narrated. And then we use uh, BigQuery BI and Shine, that it's, uh, uh, they will kill me, if, but uh, it's like a smart cache. The, I, I remember that the product person said that it's more than a smart cache, but it, de it des decides which tables to keep in memory. So when you query the data that's more used, it's always on, on that in-memory cache that it has. <laughs> but I will put out a campaign that Fishing Watches wants to make this more broadly accessible, and the thing, and anyone could use it, and the best way to do that is to have people that want to use it. So we got one internal Googler. <laughs> so if there's other groups that are doing these renderings and want to talk about this, this is very compatible with Cardo. Um, could also be possible. <laughs> uh, 
All right, any other questions from the audience of the speakers? Yes. Um, yeah, I had a question for Danny Foley, USGS. Um, I was interested in like what you had in your last couple of slides about um, increasing crop water productivity and what that would look like at different levels. Um, and I was interested in um, what does that look like for um, producers for these crops? What kind of um, productivity savings can they do? Thank you for asking. That's a great question on how crop water productivity can be improved on the ground at the field site. And that would mean improving the efficiency of how water is used to grow food. And given the scope of the lightning talk, did not focus on that. And that's not the objective of my research. We don't have anything to do with making policy decisions. So we're just providing the observations, just the objective science. And then hopefully someone else can use that information. But there are many ways that uh, water use efficiency can be improved on the ground, mostly just improving the efficiency of irrigation. As many of the sites in the Central Valley of California are irrigated, there is room for improvement to improve how the water gets to their site and how it's used. Uh, drip irrigation is one uh, scenario, leveling land, timing with the uh, best growing seasons. There, there are several ways uh, to do that, but that's not really the focus of this research. But thank you for asking. So are you saying that it's not that almonds require that many gallons of water? That's just what we're doing right now. Is that what your sense is? So we were measuring just a specific uh, area in the San Joaquin, southern central valley of California area. And that was our estimate for just the almonds within that growing region. As far as how much water almonds need everywhere, I don't know the answer to that. But there have been other studies that have used, looked at the crop water productivity of almonds in the northern central valley and the water use uh, per gallon was higher. There was a publication that said it was three gallons of water to produce one almond. And that was with on the ground studies. And this was a, a remote sensing estimate that still has room to be refined and, and to be tuned. So it could depend on, depending on where a crop is grown, it could use water more efficiently in one area versus another. And there is a concept, to the back to the first question, known as deficit irrigation, that uh, the concept anyone who's at a house plant would know, overwatering can actually be bad for crops. So you can just find the sweet spot of maybe sometimes less water is, is better for crops, depending on the crop. OK, my turn. Hey, I'm Ashley. I'm from Sprout. Um, and we look at climate for coffee farmers in East Africa. We're considering expanding. Um, I was in East Africa for about seven years digitizing supply chains. And climate change came up as a real issue for production. Um, so it's really great that we have access to satellite data. We can make insurance you know, using indexed insurance. But I think production data in agriculture is like really difficult to get in developing countries. It either doesn't exist or it's very disparate or it's on pen and paper. And you know, from the perspective of the USDA, USDA abroad or others working in developing countries, like we've had to individually go and get production data for coffee. Um, is anyone solving that? Is <laughs> should there be like a big plan to to be able to yeah uh, start to put production data together so we can we can use it as we do with climate data? I've heard of using production data. <laughs> 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 I've heard a little. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I can't help too much with that one. Uh, we have a certain list of crops that we monitor on a global scale. So kind of the biggest contributors to the global economy with crop production. Um, and coffee is not on our list yet, but definitely something tricky out. Yeah, it's always tough finding that production data for like those small stakeholders and then the larger um, areas of production. So I'd be interested as well. <laughs> so what's the coffee on the list? Um, well, <laughs> someone asked me that earlier. I was like, pop quiz. Um, we do wheat, barley, soybean, cotton, um, some oil seeds, like sunflower, rapeseed. Um, so kind of the, the, the yeah, the kind of those. Yes, definitely, yeah. I guess my follow-up to that is, do you, do you find that the production data you're collecting to build these models is adequate, is, is accurate? Uh, it's more of a question of, can we trust production data? Uh, yeah, uh, and how are you getting it? Yeah, yeah, that's remember. always the question. Um, that's kind of what our overarching goal is. So kind of 
um, fact checking other reports of production. Um, and the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service maintains its own estimates of global crop production. Um, so there we have analysts on the kind of the econ economic side and on the geospatial side who are working to um, produce those like large scale production estimates. So for a particular crop country pair, um, what is that updated estimate based on climate trends, um, conflict, things like that. Thanks. Oh, sorry, do you want to add to that? Okay. Uh, it, it may also be worth looking at the World Bank's 50 by 30 program. So part of what they're doing is helping to advance the science on how do you, how do you crop cut data to be most conducive to accurate remote sensing estimates. So is it cutting at the corners of the crop? How many samples do you take? How do you where the samples are being taken? And then actually studying the follow-on effects in terms of the accuracy of the remote sensing estimate through through resulting crop cut data. So they're using that more as a as a focus on helping governments themselves build the statistical capacity to, to do this. But I think a lot of the data is going to be made available to, to support the broader industry. Oh, perfect. I think uh, another interesting aspect of that is if you're using this to train a model that's, that's then used for insurance or purposes like that, because if you don't have really careful calibration, um, at the locale that you're interested in, or the area that you're interested in, uh, there's an accumulation of non-classical measurement error usually associated with those um, with those labels oftentimes, especially if you have um, different methods of measuring productivity, whether it's crop cut or um, like methods where uh, producers haven't been trained as much in terms of measuring their yields. So I think that's like a major thing to watch out for as well, because when you have non-classical measurement error and you're inserting that into regression equation, you're trying to figure out what your insurance is going to look like, that bias might lead to actually finding like the completely wrong sign as well, not just having attenuation, um, but actually completely missing the mark. Um, there's a couple more nonprofits I've worked with uh, for coffee. Um, your face is really familiar. I'm wondering if you've met before, but I don't know. I won't remember right now. Um, one was Farm Force, and they're, um, I forget which country movie, they're Swedish or Nor Norway. Um, and then another one is called Inveritas. Yeah. So both of those, they kind of bundle into their business model the cost of collecting. A lot of people shy away from tree crops, so I'm excited you're interested in that because everyone's hurting towards the row crops, but um, definitely in East Africa with clouds. <laughs> so these these organizations have a lot of on the ground, and then a lot of the NGOs out there have tried, but their data is backwards looking, not quite accurate. So it's exciting. Um, Abe mentioned World Bank. I think Gates is also trying to figure out not just for coffee, but all different types of crops. How could there be like a system that actually enables and incentivizes? But there's a cost, and someone has to figure out who's going to bear that, and then who benefits. So. But those two, I think, Inveritas and um, Farm Force might help. All right, we have one more round of questions here, I think. Yeah, quick question about the Global Fishing Watch. Um, I don't know a lot about it. I want to learn more. Um, if tracking the ships was part of it, um, I'm assuming it might, who was it? Yeah, it's it me. Um, so, um, yes. We started reviewing data from IS. IS is the trans that, that you, that's so where you're you want that. Okay, so then part that of my it. question to that then, yeah. thank you, is um, uh, if you're using that telemetry data or whatnot, I was curious if there were any sort of error ellipses and how you handled vector data versus raster data and how that worked for you or whatnot with the AIS data or other signals. I was just curious. I still don't get the, the, the question. Uh, you're you're trying to ask how we render that information on the map? That, or, or, or you're more talking about the data? The AIS data, yeah, I was curious if it was a point, point data source, yeah, if there was any source. error associated with e it. Every message that is transmitted by IS, that it's an um, automatic identification system, that it's actually uh, try to avoid collisions between vessels, it transmits uh, latitude, longitude, speed, and course. And with that information, we run our models, and we enrich the data, we add the apparent fishing score, and that's what we, you see in our map. You see what, 
what we consider it's an apparent fishing score. And then we create uh, other type of event that's they are available in our APIs, uh, like uh, encounters between vessels when they go to port, uh, if they are uh, loitering, that it's when they go in a very slow speed for a long amount uh, period of time that may indicate that they are encountering with other vessel that doesn't transmit or when they have gaps in their transmission, when they stop transmitting for a long period of time, not going to port. So all of that, it's what we obtain from IS uh, positions. Thank you. Oh, one more. I'm gonna commit the sin of doing a comment more than a question, but like I saw the New York Times article with your data and it was it was beautiful, it's beautifully rendered. And, um, and you know, like, did you guys cooperate with that investigation? And do you think that there will be more things like that, like where, um, you know, you're looking at the sustainable, like, do you have a take on like how sustainable fishing is like off the coast of Peru? And like, it, it seems like it, from the article it was not, not looking good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the tech part. So yeah, um, the comms department and the research and development were the ones who collaborated with Times to produce that article. So I don't have a stand here, but uh, if you have any question about the technical aspect, I'm happy to, to answer. <laughs> All right, <laughs> with that successful. Uh, <laughs> all right, with that, I think we will wrap up since we're at the end of this hour, but feel free to continue the conversation uh, in our next break here. And thank you for participating in this lightning talk. Thanks. Thanks.